Olivia's Book Club, the podcast, and I am your host, Olivia Fierro, in studio here with Margaret Stewart, so stay tuned for our book chat, and she will be recommending a book that takes us out into nature to um, have an experience, you'll understand um, why in just a moment. Um, My guest today, I'm so excited, is Paula McLean, New York Times bestselling author of The Paris Wife, joining us today to talk about her new novel, When the Stars Go Dark. It is a haunting story of kind of the darkness that lurks within us all and what drives our key player here, our detective Anna Hart, back home in search of a missing person and in search of some missing pieces of her past. So Paula, this was an absolutely beautiful book and it really is the kind of story that when you're in it is you're living in it and it's hanging with you. So thank you so much um, for writing it and for sharing it and for being with us here today. Oh my goodness, it's just such a pleasure and thank you. I'm, you know, of course I love hearing from readers and knowing they connected with the material. So thank you. It, and it connects on so many levels. So I want to talk first about when you were conceiving of this story and, and how you kind of pitched it because it it plays, it, it dances through genres. I mean, it immediately said, okay, I'm going to give this one to my husband. Many of the books that I read and really enjoy are, are not what he wants to enjoy. He's a retired uh, detective and has some cases that still kind of linger with him. Haunt him. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and so, um, you know, how did you, how did you come to conceive of it, especially because we're dancing with reality and fiction at the same time? Yeah, so I'm not sure I pitched this book so much as it pitched me. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I think our subconscious has its own agenda when these ideas, and who knows where ideas come from, but they kind of land in our lives and require a lot of, you're right, sometimes fancy dancing between genres. And when the idea came, it really came with this character fully fledged this missing persons detective who becomes obsessed with a case who it's just exactly what you described a case that haunts her and is really the case that she'll never forget that really um changed her experience in a profound way throwing her both backward into her past and forward into a future that might not have been possible Mm -hmm. if she had not encountered this mystery Mm -hmm. at exactly the moment when she needed it. She needed it. She needed a diversion. She is dealing with grief and also guilt and um, a lot of fracturing in her personal life that has been built upon a very fractured childhood. And Mm -hmm. so I guess she's she's sort of motive. Talk to me about what you think primarily motivates her both. I mean, obviously at the forefront is her work, but there's also family and there's also that history of of what what wasn't what didn't go the way that she would have liked. Well, first of all, excellent question. My God, I just love talking to smart, sensitive readers. It's just oh, the, <laughs> the best. It's just absolutely the best. So to me, Anna um, is motivated toward her career. You know, she couldn't have really chosen another career because of her background in foster care. It awakens a kind of sensitivity to the suffering of others and uh, to the voices of the unvoiced, you know, the disenfranchised, those who, like her, encounter trauma. So she's almost like this human antenna, right, for the acute suffering of others. She's led to her profession. And then something very specific happens in her personal life, which we don't know a lot about when the novel first begins, that pitches her at even, even a kind of a more breakneck, speed toward a very particular case and like all of this collision colliding happens in her current life that that illuminates the past a lot but it's mostly that her background in foster care which as i'm sure you you know was informed by my own background in foster care so that is, you're bringing your own story in, I'm sure, the the, the cells of, of that throughout the pages of this book. You're also, um, I'm sure, you know, tirelessly researching the the time, 
the cases, the missing person that um, the, the world was sort of watching and looking mm-hmm. at and the way that, that police work was changing um, so profoundly. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's changed again ever, you know, since then so many in so many different ways, but in the mm-hmm. early 1990s. So, I mean, I, I cannot imagine, and I love looking at pictures of you going to Mendocino and kind of you know, doing your physical research, but I mean, how, how, how many levels um, you were looking into very de- in, in mm-hmm. such a detailed way to bring this story together it, it, that's so immersive. Yeah, it's, it's interesting really that I decided to set the book in the 1990s because I wanted to avoid, you know, everything we know about c- crime these days. Everyone watches CSI and thinks they can solve a crime using their laptops. And what I really wanted was people talking to each other. And I wanted the book to be immersive and really character driven and atmospheric. And I didn't want the science to get in the way. So I thought, okay, no DNA, pre-DNA testing, (laughs) let's go pre-internet, pre-cell phone, essentially pre-everything. And the minute I was doing that, I was doing some background research, listening to a podcast interview between two retired FBI detectives. And the interview just happened to be of Eddie Fryer, who was the lead detective on the Polly Kloss case. So I grew up in California, very familiar with the Polly Kloss abduction, and yet I had forgotten uh, about the timeline. So it was October 1st, 1993 in Petaluma, which is 60 geographical miles away from my town of Mendocino, which is both fictional and Mm -hmm. real. And 10 days after my imaginary girl went missing. So do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I just got that feeling like the goosebumps and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And, you know, I've spent the last decade surfing the line between fact and fiction in my historical novels. But it never occurred to me for this book to be a historical novel. Mm -hmm. It just kind of fell into place and felt very profound after I made that discovery to include not just Polly's case as a a physical grounding in the world. You know, that was the world Mm -hmm. in the early 1990s. There was a rash of abductions, unsolved, most of them, in this area of California. And so if this is the world, then this is the world. Right. It's, and to be honest to that. Yeah, it, it's right? it's such a smart approach and it feels so fresh. And I mean, it, it really just it's sort of um, when you're a reader and you're kind of looking going, wait, wait, wait a second. This this is fiction. Right. OK, you're kind of, you know, <laughs> which I was. Yeah, it's we, both. It's both yeah. Right. And, and, I, and I know this story and then. OK, so but oh, I see what you're doing here. And um, and there, there's also something about timing. In addition to, you know, we think about DNA and the the simple solving of cases now, which, of course, law enforcement would say is really not so simple. But um, Mm. there's there's a a tension that can build when you are pre cell phone. I mean, we we have this this Mm. crutch right now where we can reach people at any time. I mean, to build a sense of danger and foreboding or, you know, uh, being a lone wolf out to 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 do good or or to protect somebody or whatever, protect yourself. That sense of aloneness has to be before we're walking with the phone. Isolation and it ramps up the sense of oh, danger. For definitely, sure. you mentioned atmospheric, and that is one of the key things that I wrote down while while re- reading this book and and marveling at. I'm not an outdoorsy person, so I'll, I'll tell you that. But I I I've, I've felt the the kind of the love that she has for nature and how mm-hmm. important it is to her as a person um, and be, and even to her senses, I'm, I'm sure as as somebody who is a, as law enforcement, is, is this the way that you feel about being out in, in the wild? In nature, uh-huh. absolutely. You know, I give Anna a profound sense of nature as medicine, the curative powers of nature, both to ground you in reality and to remind you of who you are. You know, we get sidetracked all the time by the busyness, the chaos of the world, and nature will always catch us, right, when we when we need it. And that's the relationship that Anna has with nature. But, you know, when she arrived in Mendocino when she was a girl in her foster care experience, Anna's foster father, Hap, which is one of the, yeah. my favorite characters I've mm-hmm. ever written, is a forest ranger. And it's really Hap that gives Anna 
this keen sense. It's like he's, it's like it's a gift to her, right? He gives her this physical competence in the woods and he teaches her how to survive in nature. Now she's already a survivor, right? She's had to survive a great deal, but this is a different level of survival. And it provides a map really for her to encounter the, the world mm-hmm. and yeah. It seems like a beautiful representation of the of the moment when she realized she could be safe somewhere and and that she could yeah. be empowered to navigate a, a path for herself where she could find some safety or some some freedom even and mm-hmm. that she could be trusting an adult who, mm. who who um who was there to to look after her and so the I, I the the relationship that she carries on um, spiritually both with with the outdoors and and then with with him and the and what he had taught her um it is very special and it feels like that thread that is so important to her without it she would probably have fallen apart yeah i think so i think nature does save her on many occasions and you know that relationship with the natural world allows her to trust herself in new ways to trust others and then to trust to return to herself so it gives her this level of inner competence and um and anchoring which nature can very very much do you know in in incorporating the holly Claus storyline you also um in in your author's notes as well talk about the the way that that case impacted people and and what you took away from what the family has said about the motivation of the good people and and kind of shining that light finding the light in the darkness and that is certainly a theme throughout this book. How important is that for you? And you know, where where do you think that 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 is evidence most in the in this story? Oh, so it's absolutely profound. And as I was researching Polly's case and thinking about my imaginary um, village, which of course is a real place, but I was thinking about how trauma, collective trauma, impacts can impact an entire community. And then if that community is going to heal, it also has to be collective, meaning they have to lean on each other. They have to reach back toward each other, even in the place of deepest kind of fear and panic and how that came together in the Polly Claus case is even the day after her disappearance, hundreds of people, regular people, right? Just people from the village, her classmates and her classmates' parents and local business owners, um, you know, went out uh, to search for her. And then it was thousands of people. And then it was tens of thousands of people. And it's really that that you can um, hold on to, right? When the world becomes a really terrifying place is to remember that, you know, we can be reminded that in the end, we kind of only have each other. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I love hearing you talk about this. And it's just such a beautiful book. And I just, prior to uh, sitting down with you, I was looking through your author's notes. And of course, you mentioned um, how much of your own personal history helped to kind of shape the storytelling. And I wanted mm-hmm. to just um, point out some of what you ha- had written about um, Anna and, and how you tied it together to your own experiences. Um, when you said that sometimes I look up and down the street as I'm walking and wonder which of the girls and women walking the other way, masked and socially distant now in 2020, share my story. I believe that our sorrow connects us, yes, and that it can also be the source of our power as well as our empathy. Anna Hart's pain has led her to the path, her destiny, and mine has led me precisely here. Mm -hmm. Did you hesitate to share so much uh, of your personal life as a writer who who chooses to write fiction? (laughs) Absolutely. I don't think anybody exposes themselves um, willfully. You know, there's always risk in telling a deeply personal story. And honestly, I didn't really know how personal I was going to be when I had that notion of Anna as a character. But as I got deeper and deeper into the story, every time I would lean on a detail, I would find myself leaning on something quite autobiographical, autobiographical, because this is the world, this is the world I know, this is my reference point. And sometimes we only have one well, so why not use it? And even though it comes with risk to be so personal, it also 
becomes a political statement and um, and gives my writing a kind of purpose as well. I'm telling a, a story. It's a mystery story. It's a suspense novel, but it also has... I think a sociological, a beating heart of something deeper, which is, you know, when we experience trauma and it alters our lives, our instinct is to hide that away and not to share that with anyone as if it's a source of great shame, these things, these terrible things that happen to us. But counterintuitively, if we can step forward and speak our truth, the truth of our experience, someone listening who shares that story will feel understood maybe for the first time and then feel maybe for the first time less alone. And so it ends that silence, it shatters that sense of shame, and it binds and connects us in really deep and abiding ways. Absolutely. And for those who haven't had those experiences it lends us the great value that comes from reading which is that that empathy mm-hmm. and that being in the shoes of the eyes of the heart of somebody who has experienced something that is profoundly mm-hmm. um, life-changing and and, and yeah. so i mean it's so true we never really know what someone yeah. else is carrying right one thing I was thinking of when you when we we heard your your pets your loved ones making <laughs> making a little a little friendly get little my growling t- noises in the background mom I need some attention um, as they always do a dog comes into Anna's life in the book so um, <laughs> if anything's going to be autobiographical I hope that you were um, at least at least channeling your own pet in in here because it, it's just a, so important to her. Yeah, so the character of Cricket, the dog that comes into Anna's life, and in fact, it's a dog that we learn chooses her instead of the other way around. And I think people really do feel that sense. I certainly do, that my dog, you know, kind of chose me, right? Rescued me instead of the other way around. And in Anna's life in particular, because she's lost so much trust of others, a dog is maybe the, the most maybe the only way she's going to get close to somebody else and really start to rely on this, you know, she won't admit she needs a partner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cricket becomes her partner and becomes her touch point mm-hmm. and becomes a physical, just a physical being, a comfort object in her world and, um, and becomes really relevant and particular to the story as well. And Cricket's a real dog. I mean, that's not my dog. My dog is here in the room with me and her name is Piper and she's magnificent. But at the dog Cricket, I, you know, I was out doing an event um, for my historical novel, Love and Ruin, uh, when I was working on this book and I met a dog named Cricket and that dog just looked into my soul. <laughs> and I just thought this, this dog belongs in a story. And so I made her a promise that I was going to put her in a book and and I did. So. Oh, that is awesome. This dog has some knowing eyes. There's some there's something going on with this dog, right? That's when you think, who were you before? Right? Exactly. Well, how many lives have you had? Exactly. Uh, Tell us a story. This is not your first go around. If only you could share some of your stories with me. Um, mm-hmm. Speaking of comfort, and I, I, I am fascinated by that the incredible work that an author can do sitting down in that solitary space to be writing a novel but also have uh, the, the, be able to enjoy and embrace the sharing of that, uh, of that book when, when it comes out and being with other writers. So when we had the pleasure of interviewing Christina Baker Klein, I understand that you were actually out getting the provisions for Dark and Stormies for her, <laughs> for her, for her evening, which it was like, this is the, the greatest little literary sorority that I wanna know everything about. <laughs> Absolutely. And I do miss that in this current landscape where we are more isolated and travel is so limited. But Christina and I uh, met at a a writer's festival in Kauai a few years ago and instantly bonded and became great friends. And um, I yes, I happened to be in in her house in Maine when you (laughs) interviewed her. And yes, we did make it dark and stormy for her paperback release that night. But that feeling that you can meet um, like minded people, people who uh, be, can become dear friends on the path, even as as adults. You know those close friendships that we come to rely on 
in our youth, those can still happen um, as we get older. And in fact, they can be even more special because we have so much life experience to share. And of course, when you meet another writer, then you can also share this other stuff, the, the language of the world that you're both in and moments of anxiety, but also moments of joy we can celebrate with each other. And I can also take questions to her, things I'm you know anxious about, or so we can really lean on each other in this, in this way. And it's my favorite thing. I mean, particularly, I have a lot of dear women friends who are writers who are just badasses just kind of doing the most amazing work and to find that we are supporting and, and celebrating each other and embracing each other instead of a landscape of competition it's just love and support and couldn't we all use a little more of that heck yes and it is just i just love i love hearing uh, and and seeing any time these groups are together or doing these events together and it's i mean a reminder you've got the the beautiful floor to ceiling bookshelf behind you there's room for all the books i mean there, <laughs> there really is right each one is totally there unique there is room for all the books <laughs> even if you have to build more bookcases exactly. or move to a bigger house there is room for all the books you could ever want just get creative um I, my compliments to you, I went through a, the book club kits that you have on your website, and it's I'm a huge fan of, of the, the books that have been coming out where we've got kind of accompanying elements to feed all of our senses. So you have not only a playlist, but also a pretty fancy recipe to go with. That's right. For Portuguese mussels, is that what Yes, <laughs> it is. Is this something you really make? Yeah, it's something I really make. I love to cook. I love the creativity of cooking. But, you know, I learned to cook as a waitress. Like I was a waitress even into my 30s so I could work on my writing. I was also a bartender. So there's a cocktail recipe, I think, somewhere. I do a lot of cocktail recipes on my on my Instagram. Oh, good to know. Um, yeah, but that particular recipe is inspired by some muscles that I had at Patterson's Cafe in Mendocino. Now Patterson's is um, almost a character in the book because um, Anna and others meet there to discuss the case. And um, but it's uh, you know it's the towny it's the towny bar it's the mm -hmm. place where all the locals go in Mendocino and it's just really homey and warm and lovely and yes those muscles I think we all um, need to try <laughs> spicy <laughs> mussels with chorizo yes yeah. please with a, mm -hmm. what would be your cocktail of choice to go with that or would that be a with wine that, pairing? probably a beer but <laughs> oh yes <laughs> so really good beer um but i think is it not in the book club i'm starting to to forget i didn't is there see a, a cocktail. cocktail recipe i think we talked about making my fame, my, my famous, when people come to my house, the cocktail that I make them is a whiskey sour. Oh, nice. Like an old fashioned whiskey mm -hmm. sour, like shaken with egg white. And sometimes I, you know, muddle blackberries or peach and raspberry or oh. you know, a combination. Rhubarb has been known to wow. make it. You know, I make my own, um, fruit syrups for cocktails. And again, it's creative, <laughs> like food, and the flavor profiles of food and how flavors go together. And, you know, cocktails are, uh, can be very, I think, um, creative. If you're thinking about them as food, if you're only going to have one, it should be sensational, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No wonder you're able to make new friends so easily, by the way. <laughs> right? I mean, you are my friend. If you are truly my friend, I will cook for you. A Paula McLean, like your home dish and a craft cocktail. Uh, that is pretty remarkable. And tell you a story. <laughs> and I'll tell you a story. And tell maybe you if you're really interesting, you'll find your your way or your pet will find your way or into your my dog next book. will someday find their way <laughs> into one of my books somewhere paula before we lose you i each i love to ask our excuse me our our novelists about when you first remember becoming a reader since we assume all writers mm -hmm. are also passionate readers and what do you what do you remember um being the first book that just this blew you away or, or, or showed Absolutely. you the magic in the page. Absolutely. The magic carpet is what it is. And I remember about second grade, and it's very tied to my experience in foster care. My sisters and I moved 
chaotically and, and a great deal in our early years. And at a certain point, I became terrified to make new friends when we went to a new school. So I made a promise to myself to only make friends with librarians. Oh. And that was really, um, you know, the library became my safe haven and the place where I would go, not just to feel physically safe, but then to feel like I could be myself in the world of my imagination. And books do show us ourselves, don't they? Mm -hmm. When we read something like, for instance, when I read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, you know, that's that in you know it's a historical novel and yet i recognized myself or another favorite book from that time was watership down which is about rabbits in the uk and yet i found myself in the story of those rabbits and then both of those stories are about resilience and so i was really i think um escaping my current circumstances but i was also building my imagination. I was building a world inside myself and I was creating a writer, whether I knew it or not. So thanks to libraries and books and librarians and readers and book clubs. And, you know, this is the conversation that is still my favorite conversation to have. My favorite question to ask every book club and every new friend I make is what are you reading? Or what's the last thing you read that you can't forget about, you know? Ah. Uh. Thank you so much. We, we, we just need to show up on the door and ask for a drink because we found our people. Mar <laughs> Margaret's mom, mom and sister librarians. Mm -hmm. Sister, sister, not mom. Oh, <laughs> mom is president of the Friends of the Library Association. Well, I overstepped. Okay. But well, sister is, is librarian. Well. Might as well. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll be expecting you, so come on over. <laughs> ding dong, we're here from Arizona. Ding dong. Paula McLean, the new book is When the Stars Go Dark. It is gorgeous, and it will stay with you and um, for, for, for very good reason. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's been just a delight talking to you. So I think we both have a new obsession, and her name is Paula McLean. Yep. She's amazing. Oh, boy. When you told me before we <laughs> talked to her that she had a recipe to go along with her book, I'm like, wow. We're taking immersive to the next a level. A recipe and a playlist. I mean, please, everybody, take note of this. Yes. I think, I think that's the most exciting part is we're getting more immersive in these books. Yes. Like she said, she was aiming for immersive, and here we are. And I think... I mean, really, we might have Instagram to thank for this also because oh, yeah. these authors have put themselves in this space where we're really kind of embracing and, you know, the delicious covers and oh, yeah. the different scenes that go with themes and all of this. But I really love this. And I've always, I mean, the first time I ever hosted a book club, I was living in Las Vegas and we did The Help. And oh, I mean, wow. basically what everybody did is their first yeah. book club. This was a couple of years ago. And... I'm a terrible cook. I can't do any of the stuff that, that she was talking about in our interview, but it was, what can I do to make this a theme? And of mm -hmm. course, to make a chocolate pie. Of course, and you make a chocolate pie. Do, <laughs> it had to do some kind of, I found that, um, you know, uh, what is it, like a tea flavored vodka that you put in the lemonade. Oh, yeah. It did a whole like Southern oh, thing. sweet tea vo yes. vodka. And it was just so fun. And I so, I mean, if you're hosting and doing a book club, you really want all of these resources at your disposal. Oh, I I would hope that there's got to be an immersive cocktail moment. Yeah. I hope that at some point we will be able to join our book club back in person mm -hmm. and maybe do something like mm -hmm. where it's a themed cocktail. Mm -hmm. No, we we haven't been together in a, in a, a minute. A long time. But, um, and I think our last was at Changing Hands, and they have a bar there, but I believe it's only beer and wine. Yes. But I'm but sure still. we could figure out a way to... <laughs> Get a, a fancy spicy cocktail right. in there. Her whiskey sour sounded incredible. She told us about that. Uh, yes, just about after we had stopped recording yeah. with Paula, she was kind of going into detail about the um, the accoutrement for the, the cocktail that she had made for the Exiles paperback at Christina's house. And I mean, so it's really amazing for people when you have somebody who is in your friend circle and in, is that natural entertainer or that person who, you know, their love language is food and, and they want to feed you and well. I, I, I want to feed people well, but I can't even feed myself well. 
So I appreciate people who yeah. are friends who will who bring that in or encourage me mm-hmm. or inspire me, not encourage, mm-hmm. but to start cooking. Like mm-hmm. that sounded great. I might do no. that this weekend. I'm house sitting and you know what? Nothing sounds better than leaving your own friend's house smelling like mussels. <laughs> that's a good, actually, that's a, yeah, do, <laughs> cook fish for They'll sure. They'll never know. For sure. They're in Hawaii, fish. so they'll come back and be yeah. like, does it smell like Hawaii? In yes, here? yes, it, it does. does. That's exactly what it is. Briny, <laughs> very briny. Um, so this, as she was talking about her kind of love of nature, and and what a focal point that is in this book. I mean, both both in beautiful moments and in kind of scary moments, mm-hmm. and integral to this character. You were thinking of another one that you enjoyed that really kind of almost kind of got you on this crazy. Yeah. Um, reading spiral that you're <laughs> yeah the spiral only got you know faster yes. and a little like smaller where right. it's a little bit faster if that even made sense but yes so I had as I've mentioned before went to a librarian conference with my sister the very first one I had gone to with her and I got an arc um, an advanced reader copy of Leave No Trace by Mindy Mejia. Mm-hmm. And I picked it up only because I had just started dabbling in the library. I'd pick up one book at a time. And by that, I mean like once every six months. Mm-hmm. I was really not reading very much. And this book, because I had already read another of her books, I was super excited to see an author, a current author that I recognized. Mm-hmm. And so I picked it up. And this book, Leave No Trace, is about a boy I guess he's a teenager when he returns, but he had been dis- he had disappeared for 10 years. He and his father just vanished without a trace. And suddenly he comes back and he is violent. He doesn't really talk. Mm-hmm. And so they take him to a psychiatry, um, psychiatric ward where the main character, she is an assistant therapist. And she tries, they're like, hey, why don't you try to figure out what's going on with him? Where he, where he, where has he been the last 10 years? Because he came out of the forest, essentially. And it ends up that he had been in the Boundary Waters, I believe, in Minnesota, the, the Glacial Lakes. Mm-hmm. And he had just been spending all this time back there. And, but why was he back there? Yeah. Was a whole, mm-hmm. that's the whole point the of book. the story. But it was very, very much in the same context as as this book where nature is a very huge mm-hmm. part of this the of this story as well as you know trying to figure out where this disappeared this missing child went but not everyone comes back mm-hmm. and that's the the bigger thing like okay you came back but where have you been mm-hmm. and what has happened to you and why can't you talk mm-hmm. and eventually he there are pieces that come together and they figure it out what's been going on but when you when we were talking about it, that's the first thing I thought of was mm. this book. And I, from that moment, reading that book, it sent me into a trajectory of, I only, I read 15 books that year. I was very proud of myself. Last <laughs> you know, year you were? I was at 70 last year. Jeez. I'm at 80. <laughs> as of this recording, I'm at 84 <laughs> of the year. Although I just saw someone on Instagram. This will blow your mind. Um, she liked one of my photos and I was like, oh, I'm going to check her out. She's read like 180 something ah. books so far this year. And I went, whoa, that's got to be your whole job, right? Like that's, right. that's got to be your whole job. I mean, yes. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I was dumbfounded. I was like, wait till I tell Olivia. Whoa. <laughs> she thinks 82 is impressive. Well, so maybe that's somebody who has an attention span where you could do, maybe you're a speed reader. I or hope. which keeps coming up on my Kindle, this ad for some kind of speed reading book or something. I don't know what it is. Oh, like train, um, how to train how yourself to, train to yourself, be a speed yeah. reader. Um, mm-hmm. Or maybe she's somebody who can crazy multitask and could be listening to an audio while reading a book. I, <laughs> oh, you mean like at the exact same time? Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh like boy. it could be exact. You, I mean, you'd have to. I mean, how could you? Or you don't sleep. Or it's it's literally her whole job. Maybe I yes. I didn't dive so deep in to see like how many followers she had. Right. If this was her whole job, but my my first thought was, how? there's no way she has a, a forty hour a week work job. No, job. no, 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 no. Like uh-uh. there's just no way. Heiress. I hope. <laughs> 
<laughs> I hope she has lots of money and lots Chase of books. Chase Lounge, and a swimming pool, a beach view, and a pile of books. Beautiful bookshelf. Oh, yeah, I don't, for sure. I hope she doesn't have a pile anywhere. I hope <laughs> she's got the biggest bookshelves, yeah. like Beauty and the Beast, like oh, big, big, big library. library yeah. Every person's dream, whether you yes. read or oh, not. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the big, elegant library. Uh, she must have that. Or, I mean, how fast can people... I was actually just looking at... Um, uh, who was it? One, one of the authors that we, we've interviewed, uh, her website, she was talking about um, enjoying the audiobooks, but at a very high speed. Oh, that's what I do. So I cannot do that. Okay, so. I don't like that. When you check out, a, I, I don't know about Audible because I don't pay for books, as you I said. You can do the same thing. I mean, you can do the. But with like Overdrive, which I get from the library, as I've mentioned, you could only go up to speed of two times the speed. Mm-hmm. With NetGalley, mm-hmm. you can go up to three times the speed. And I tried doing that because I could understand it. The problem was at that speed, it starts to skip words a little bit. And so you kind of don't know what they're saying. So I pulled it back to like two and a half. Ooh, I can't can't do that. It's honestly, well, I was only able to do that half speed faster with Dorinda. Oh yeah. Well, I think they all, they all are instructed to read very slow. Mm I had to speed up Barack Obama's book. Mm-hmm. I could well, not. Take a year. Well, it's also <laughs> not, you know, it's just not my normal genre of like, uh-huh. let's dive deep into politics, which, boy. and it's it's like a very long, long, long mm-hmm. first volume part. one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I did, and I didn't even know it was multiple <laughs> volumes until it was like. I'm going to be so proud of myself when I finish this book. Yeah. Oh, wait, what? There's it another ended, volume? <laughs> it ended with Obama, um, Osama bin Laden's um demise and i went oh no we got some time to go here <laughs> i mean i loved it but yeah. it's just whew. so you have to speed some uh-huh. of those up but as we've talked about before anything with dialects you got to be careful because it's kind of hard to understand a dialect that you're not used to yeah like irish dialect or australian sometimes or british it also depends right now i'm listening to an audiobook i will be finished with it by the time this podcast comes out but it's called um Damnation Spring. Mm-hmm. I, we talked about this yesterday. And this book, the audio itself, there's a female and a male and a female who plays like the their child. Mm-hmm. You know, she just does dual. And I can understand the woman narrator at the high speed much better than mm-hmm. I can understand the male because of how deep his voice is. Oh. And so sometimes that's a little bit harder. So that girl probably is speed reading and listening mm-hmm. to audiobooks on 10 times the speed. <laughs> That's just not, or she's not, probably an overachiever. It's supposed to be enjoyable. Right. And we've talked about that yeah. trying to, and that's, I've kind of slowed down a little bit just to be enjoying it more versus ticking a box. Right. Like I finished this, I finished mm-hmm. this, I finished this book. Great. I don't want it to be a trophy, right? Mm-hmm. I want it to be enjoyable, but I hope. She's making buku bucks on reading that many wow. books. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. Mm. And I'm sure she might not even be like high ranked in the, in that idea. There's probably somebody out there who's already read 500 books this year. And God bless them because <laughs> where you find the time. If you know someone who has read more books than that, you have got to let us know. Please. You can just email us directly, right? Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com. Until then. Whatever speed you like, whatever style you mm. like, the old fashioned pick up a book, maybe an e reader, maybe the library, and just sit there and you read it right there on the library floor. Or just have someone read it to you. Ooh, that sounds nice. Enjoy your books. Thanks for listening to Olivia's Book Club, the podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Fierro. Our producer is Margaret Stewart. You can send us an email with your thoughts or your book recommendations. Olivia's Book Club at azfamily.com is the address. And you can check out Olivia's Book Club on Facebook or find us on Instagram. Hello, bookstagrammers, at olivias.bookclub. And Margaret is at overbooked and overdue. Make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast and tell your friends. You can find us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Amazon Music.